I'm Wes Ketchum. Um, uh, as Samantha said, I, I'm an associate scientist here at Fermilab. I've been working at Fermilab on various things for the, about the past 10 years. Um, I've been doing neutrino physics um, for about the past uh, five to six years or so. Um, and so today I'm going to uh, talk a little bit, the title's a little uh, uh, ambitious, um, but uh, we'll get, towards the end, we'll get to really where we're, um, well, I, what excites me about neutrinos and what it, you know, what really, why we're really interested in studying them, what we think it can tell us about the universe. But first, we'll go through a bit of a, a, bit of a history lesson, because I think the history is, is really outstanding and, and, really, and really also helps us understand so why these particles are so interesting. So, um, First, stage one, I have done a terrible thing. Okay, so the, the uh, history of neutrinos really starts with the history of radioactivity. So, uh, so you know, around the turn of the uh, 20th century, right, uh, uh, right in around 1896, um, Henry Becquerel and Pierre Curie and Marie Curie, um, kind of uh, at a very similar time, sort of discovered this really, you know, interesting thing. So I think I, I think the story is that Henry had sort of left. Uh, he left some, you know, uranium salts, so some some th you know, uh, chemicals that had uranium in them, on a photographic plate. Um, left it there overnight and was covered and everything. And he came back in the morning and it was, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, it had, you know, uh, it had uh, developed on the photograph. And so that was weird because it was, you know, covered up and everything. There was no light that could have hit it. And so, uh, so it, it was an indication that there was some kind of particle or something that was going through and actually, you know, interacting with uh, with the photograph. And the similar things that were seen by uh, uh, by the Curies and with different chemicals, you know, a lot of uranium, thorium, things, things that we now know to be very, you know, radioactive but naturally occurring. And so, uh, you know, that won a Nobel Prize. One of the first Nobel Prizes, actually, was for the discovery of this radioactivity. And so this really excited the physics world at the time. And so, you know, so immediately people tried to go in and try to understand what was going on. And they found, you know, there's multiple kinds of radioactivity. But there's two, I think, that are really interesting to highlight. So one of the first was uh, with uh, what are called alpha decays. So you'll have some kind of nucleus. And then it will emit these kind of heavy particles, which are really like helium nuclei. So it's like two protons protons and two neutrons sort of glued together. And these will get thrown off from a nucleus, uh, some particular kinds of nucleus with some energy. And then there was this kind of different kind of radioactivity, um, which were called beta decays, where you have a nucleus again, and it would seem to emit just an electron out. So, you know, a nice small little electron, you know, electrons that normally sort of circle the atom and, you know, make up, uh, you know, the, everything around us. And what's actually going on in beta decays is you just have an individual neutron, basically, that decays into a proton and an electron. So the neutron's neutral, and so then it, and it has a little bit more mass than the proton. So it, when it decays into the proton, um, the proton's positively charged, the electron's negatively charged, so charge is conserved. And the, the difference in mass between the neutron and the proton um, goes into partly into the energy that the electron carries off with it. And so this would later, you know, this was some of the early days of radioactivity. It was even sort of the early days of, you know, our understanding of modern physics and things like that. So this was even a little bit before, you know, E equals MC squared. And this idea that mass can turn into energy was really sort of starting to evolve around this time. Um, but, you know, people would look at the energies that, of the particles that would come out, um, and they would see things like this. So on the, on the left-hand side here, you have, you know, some typical uh, uh, energy spectra of those alpha particles, those kind of heavy helium nuclei, basically, that would get emitted from the nucleus. And they really came in these nice, sharp lines, and that seemed to make sense. So you just have, you know, the theory sort of developed that you must have, you know, these nuclei, and they're kind of in some kind of excited state. And so these alpha particles carry, you know, they, you know, the nuclei settle from one state to the other, and the alpha particles carry, you know, the difference in that, en that energy state. And, you know, it's these known states, it's always the same, it's, you know, it's always sort of the, you know, the, the structure of the atom and the nucleus. And so, you know, they just carry the same energy all the time. <coughs> But for beta decays, it was different. You can see an example of the energy spectrum from beta decay on the right there. It's not this nice line. This, it's actually this really you know, smooth continuum of energies. So these electrons would come out not with some known energy, that, not some difference in energy that, you know, that should really just be sort of the difference in mass between the neutron and proton. But they actually you know, seem to carry only part of that energy. And so that was kind of weird because we thought that you know the difference in energy should you know there's only one particle that was seen coming out and so 
what, what could be going on here? And so, you know, there were kind of two thoughts that sort of then emerged to try to explain this at the time. So first was that, you know, there, energy is not conserved. Now that had been sort of a, you know, standard of physics for quite some time. This is something, you know, from, you know, from Newton and all the way through, you know, kind of one of the, you know, early things in physics that, you know, that you have this conservation of energy. And so any, if you've taken physics in, in school and things like that, you know, momentum and energy, those things are conserved. You know, you start in one state, you start in the other state, and you know, those, those things all have to be the same. But people were really quick. They're like, oh, look, not, doesn't happen. Like, so, you know, there, there's, you know, that's just new physics. That's really interesting and cool. And then there are other people that are like, okay, well, maybe, you know, maybe there's some other way to explain this. We should try to think of, you know, because, you know, we like energy conservation. It's worked really well for us in the past. Why do we want to just, like, throw that out? We, you know, we should try to think of some other idea. And so it turns out, and it kind of came out that uh, the, the first person to really propose that some viable alternative was Wolfgang Pauli. And he, really, he proposed it in a really kind of funny way. So there's this letter, this very famous letter that he wrote in 1930. And so he wrote it to the attendees at a conference that was going on in, in Europe, I think in Germany someplace. And he was like, and leads off, you know, okay, so it's in German. So if you know German, you can, you know, read the thing. But the, 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 the title was Dear Radioactive Ladies and Gentlemen. And then he goes through, and he goes through a full description and sort of thing. You know, he apologizes. I'm really sorry. I can't be there. But I have this really cool party I have to be at, you know, in two days. And so, you know, yada, yada. But I know that you guys are all meeting together. And I have this idea that, you know, maybe there's a new particle. That's you know that's carrying away some of the energy here, and so uh, he he called that particle the you know he actually called it the neutron. This was even before sort of you know understanding everything there. But that particle now we know it as the neutrino. He said, okay, if you have this other particle that's there um, that as part of this decay, so, you know the electron takes some of the energy and the neutrino takes some of the other energy, and voila. Energy is conserved, problem solved. We, you know, we can all be very happy, and you know, and so this is a good way to make sure that we have energy conservation. It seems really obvious in hindsight, but you know, people weren't really, you know, people weren't really apt to just like go inventing new particles and stuff everywhere. This was, you know, this was early days before we were, you know, discovering new particles all the time. So people didn't want to just, you know, you know, throw this sort of out here. And he was almost apologetic in the letter. He's like, "I'm sorry, I don't really want to do this, but you know, we could maybe explain it by doing, you know, something like this. That could be, it could be true." Um, but it was just sort of in theory. So you know, the question was, you know, well, okay, you know, this new and this new particle because of the because of the you know the where the endpoint of the electron energy was on the spectrum, it looked like there were a really small number of electrons that basically carried all of the energy. And so you kind of knew it had this neutrino had to have basically no mass, or it had to be very, 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 very light if it had any kind of mass. So OK, but great. So we have an idea. We have a nice theory. And so good. It would be nice to try to test it. Um, so this actually, this new theory actually helped enable a lot of new theoretical developments in physics. So this was you know, starting, to, starting to be when the first um, understandings of uh, uh, of a lot of nuclear physics and really kind of a grounded theory and you know grounded quantum field theory to dis to, to describe all of these different radio radioactivities and these new uh, particles and new interactions and things like that and so the, you know Enrico Fermi was actually one of the first people who used to be a professor in Chicago he's where Fermi lab is named after he's one of the first people he was one of the first people to really kind of bring together and develop like a full functioning theory to describe how these beta decays would happen and and, and it turns out that you know this theory was really nice. It described a lot of new stuff, but it it predicted sort of two things. One, the neutrino really was massless, or that it should be massless, and two, that it interacted very weakly. So they actually called it the weak interaction, and that described a lot of these radioactive radioactive decays um, because it seemed so much weaker than uh, the really the known force at the time, electromagnetism. So you know we had there was a very strong theory of you know electricity and magnetism that was together. And you know, the, and that was related to light, and you know that had been developed in the previous century. And this new force was a brand new thing, and it, but it was very weak compared compared to electromagnetism. So they called it the weak force. And in the calculations and going through, it, if you followed this theory, which seemed to match up everywhere else, this neutrino like never interacted. So a neutrino will actually travel through more than a light year of lead 
before it would interact on average. Think about that for a second. Lead, you know, I don't know. I spent some time as an undergraduate sort of building, you know, a radioactivity assay chamber. We use lead to kind of keep out other particles because it's so dense. So you have these, you know, these lead bricks that I had to carry from one end of the lab to the other. It was really awful. You know, that's what they make students do when you're learning. Um, but, you know, lead is dense, it's heavy, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, some of the densest material and stuff that we have sort of naturally occurring. And, you know, you would have to have a light year of it, not the size of the, not the size of the earth, not the size, you know, not the distance from the earth to the sun. You know, it takes, uh, how long does it take for light to go from the sun to the earth? You know, uh, eight minutes, right? Yeah. So that's eight light minutes, right? Think of stacking lead all the way from the earth to the sun and then, you know, times how many minutes in a day, how many days in a year, you know, that's, in, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. And so this was, people were a little weirded out by this and actually kind of a little dismayed. So Polly actually said, I've done a really terrible thing. I've postulated a particle that we cannot possibly detect because it just never interacts. And there were a lot of other theorists and stuff that came along at the time. And you know, there were a lot of famous statements from people saying that there's basically, there's just no possible way of measuring, you know, how are you going to have you know, one radioactive decay that produces this one particle and it will go through you know, that much material without ever interacting? It just seems impossible. But the theory worked. So people were, you know, it, it's not, there, there'd be no proof of it, but you know, it seemed to work in every other way. So it kind of gained some acceptance. So this was sort of the, this is where things stood sort of in the 19, you know, in the 1930s and leading up to World War II. Okay, so traction to the, cha to the challenge. So these guys, um, so Frederick Rines is on the left and Clyde Cowan on the, on the right. Um, this was after, you know, shortly after the war. Um, I think both of them were involved in the Manhattan Project. So a lot of, you know, a lot of the current a lot of the current sort of particle physics in, in the US and the world really kind of grew up in some sense out of the Manhattan Project. That's where you know, the Department of Energy was originally the Atomic Energy Agency, which was you know, involved with a lot of the scientists and stuff that you know, worked at Los Alamos National Lab and helped develop the atomic bombs and really understood a lot of the physics of the, you know, this new interesting physics using all of the things you know, that they had learned about weak interactions and radioactivity and all those things before, all these new, all these new theories. So these guys, you know, they were, they were working, you know, at, at the labs. And uh, uh, Frederick Rines on the left, he actually was, you know, he, he basically, you know, he'd been doing some work. And then he went to his boss at Los Alamos, I think, and said, okay, you know, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to kind of do something of my own. I've been doing a lot of work with, you know, this very, all you know, this nuclear theory sort of stuff that you've needed me to do for defense and other sort of things. And I'd kind of like to just, you know, take a sabbatical a little bit, take a few months and kind of think of my own project. And, you know, back then, you know, kind of now too, the, you know, the uh, people were like, yeah, you know, we want smart people to stay motivated and continue to work. So yeah, you know, go off, sit in an office for a few months, come up with an idea. And so the best thing he could come up with, he was just trying to think of what to do. And the best thing he could come up with was like, maybe we could look for the neutrino. Um, and so, you know, cause you know, it was hard and nobody else was going to do it. So why not? And it turns out, so he was actually, he was kind of mulling this over and he, um, he actually was, he was on a, on a business trip with, uh, with Clyde on the right. Um, and they got grounded in Kansas city on an airplane and they were talking and they're like, we should do some work together. And they're like, yeah, okay. So what should we do? And Clyde had an idea. He's like, we should work on, what was it? Like positronium or something like that. Frederick was like, no, 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 you know, that's really interesting and cool, but you know, other people are already doing that. Like, you know, what are we going to do that's different? And then they decide, okay, well, maybe, maybe we could go after the neutrino. Maybe we could really try to go after and try to detect the neutrino, because you know they had, you know, they had some interesting ideas. So, for instance, uh, so they had an idea of how to try to detect it. So, do you remember? I showed you how beta decay works, right? That you have a neutron that will. Uh, let's see if I have the thing here. Yeah. So uh, you have a neutron. It'll you know, sort of decay and turn into a proton, and it emits an electron, and, and alongside that electron, it emits an antineutrino. So that's how, you know, that's beta decay. And so then there's a thing called inverse beta decay. Basically, you run the thing backwards in a sense. So you have a proton. If you have an antineutrino come in, then it should, there's some chance it will interact. This is how neutrinos, antineutrinos should interact. And what it'll create is it'll create a neutron. 
which will maybe you know have a little bit of energy and bounce around a little bit, and it'll create a positron, you know, the the, the anti-electron that will go off. And so, okay, so that's how you know. So I told you, you know, these things happen really, really rarely, but when they do happen, that's how they happen, and that's that's what the theory predicts. So, okay, so they said, all right, so we can think of a detector, and so what we'll do is we'll try to, you know, we'll have a bunch of water and it has some dissolved cadmium in it, and I'll explain why the cadmium is important in a second. Um, and what we'll hope is that we'll have, in this water, we'll have, you know, neutrinos come and interact in the water, do this thing where they, you know, uh, anti-neutrino uh, anti will interact with a proton, produce a neutron, and, that, and then we'll, what we'll set up outside of it is this liquid scintillator, which is basically this kind of uh, liquid material, when you have a particle go through, it creates a flash of light. And then on the side of the liquid scintillator, we'll have these uh, what are called PMTs, photomultiplier tubes, which are basically look like big light bulbs. And what they do is when a, uh, a photon comes in, when a particle of light comes in, uh, it basically amplifies the signal and turns it into an electrical signal that can then you know, register that we actually saw some kind of photon. So it's a nice little particle detector. You have you know, the detecting medium in the middle, and then this detector that you know, when you have some kind of particles go through it will give you a nice little flash of light, and then you'll know you have a neutrino. And so really how it works, okay, so going back to the inverse beta decay thing here. So remember, so we have an anti-neutrino come in. The water has protons in it. So it interacts with one of those protons, creates a neutron, creates a positron. And so then what happens, what should happen then, is that positron will go through. It'll quickly annihilate. It's an antimatter particle. So it's going to find some other matter particles to, uh, to interact with. And when uh, antimatter and matter come together, they produce photons. And so those photons, you, know, you should be able to maybe detect one of those in your PMTs that you have. And then that neutron will, okay, it'll bounce around a little bit. There we go. Bounces rather quickly this time through. And what it does is that actually gets captured by that cadmium atom. And when that happens, just so happens it's weird physics and stuff, but that cadmium atom will then gets kind of excited and emits some decay, you know, some photons in decay. And that difference in time is then how you can try to have a signal of what goes on. So that you have a sort of a prompt interaction or a prompt flash of light from that positron. That neutron bounces around a little bit, and a little bit of time after that, not too much, but a little bit of time after that, you'll have these, these photons from the cadmium atom. So, okay, it's a cute idea of how to do this. So this is Frederick saying basically what I just said, saying like, this is a nice clean signature. We should see delayed coincidence with a prompt pulse from this positron annihilation, and then a few microseconds later, so a little bit of time, but not too much time. Uh, microseconds, you know, a millionth of a second, which, uh, Seems really small, but in physics terms, that you know, that's enough time to you know know that it's something different. Um, that you should see this ne neutron capture on the cadmium. Cute detector idea. Now all you need is a lot of neutrinos, right? If they interact so rarely, then you need a whole lot if you're going to have any kind of chance of getting them. Um, so and, and so this is basically how all neutrino detectors work: is that you want as much material as you can to detect on. And then you want to see as many neutrinos as you can in that material. And just so happens that if you have enough neutrinos, you know, trillions and trillions and trillions of neutrinos, that you'll sometimes get an interaction. OK, so these guys, you know, when the neutrino was first coming out, you know, first postulated and stuff, people were like, we're never going to get it. But these guys, they had an idea. We know how neutrinos, where there's lots of neutrinos. They worked on the bomb. So they were like, okay, first idea, we should use a nuclear bomb to see neutrinos. They proposed this. <laughs> so they, you know, there's the, you know, the, the test, and they were thinking, okay, well, we'll put this, you know, nice detector, nice particle detector we have down a shaft, and we have some, you know, it's okay. It, it's kind of suspended, but when the bomb goes off, it might fall, and there's some feathers and foam rubber at the bottom that'll catch it and that sort of thing. And even better, even better than them proposing this, Fre Fre Frederick Rines told the story that he, he was like, okay, like, you know, he, was, he went to Fermi. Fermi was working at Los Alamos at the time, too. And he went to Fermi and said, okay, I want to do neutrinos. And Fermi was like, all right, sure. How, how, what do you, you know, and where, where are you going to get your neutrinos from? He's like, well, you know, I think the most neutrinos I can get is from the bomb. And Fermi was like, 
Good start, yeah. The bomb, that's, a, that's definitely a good start. He actually, yeah, he didn't, he was like, yeah, okay, maybe this will work. That was the start of the thinking at the time. It took a while and some other conversation to realize, okay, maybe there's a better way to do this. Um, they could have a more comfortable working environment if they just put a detector really close to a nuclear reactor. So it's the same kind of physics. You don't have as many neutrinos as you have in one nuclear explosion. You can just imagine you know, the difference in energy between them. But you know, you're still creating the energy. The ener that energy, there's a lot of it. And so you'll create a lot of neutrinos. So a reactor produces you know, at, at their detector, which was I think about 10 meters away from you know, the core of the reactor, so really close. They were seeing you know, it should be about 10 trillion neutrinos per centimeter squared per second in their detector. That was the sort of the rate that they were expecting of neutrinos to hit their detector. So when I say that you need a lot of neutrinos to have a chance at seeing anything, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. 10 trillion a second per square, you know, per the size of your thumbnail, you know, in order to have a chance at seeing some occasionally. Okay, so they, you know, they, they do this. It's the, it was the Savannah uh, River reactor, I think, in North Carolina, or in the Carolinas, maybe South Carolina. Um, and so, okay, and you can see them working very nicely, much more comfortably um, uh, than what would, I assume, be near a nuclear bomb going off, um, near, the, near the nuclear reactor. And so uh, that 10 trillion per second per the size of your thumbnail gave them three events per hour. That's pretty good, actually. You know, that's, a, that's not so bad. You know, get close enough and do that. And so that was, and that was in 1956. So Pauli proposed it in 1930, 1956. Finally, the thing is discovered, even though nobody was expecting that this could happen. And they sent a very nice telegram to him that we're happy to inform you that we've definitely detected these neutrinos that you postulated a while ago. So good story, right? Great. Now, so. It's not that people didn't believe the theory before, but you have to see it, right? Like you have to see the particle, you know, before you're really going to believe that, believe that it's there. So the rest of the sort of our understanding of particle physics sort of evolved from there. But neutrinos are an integral part of that. So uh, on, the, on the right here is sort of the known particles that are part of the standard model, though I don't have the Higgs boson on here. But so you can have, you know, those, those particles in red are the quarks. And so the up and down quark on the, on the left-hand side of that column there, those are the things that actually make up protons and neutrons. So those are the things that make up sort of everyday life. And then on the bottom left-hand side, you see the electron. So you, know, you combine those ups and downs and quark, up quarks and down quarks together, you create nuclei. Combine those with electrons, you create atoms. That's sort of the things of everyday life. And the electron has this partner, the electron neutrino. And we later discovered uh, that there's kind of three copies of this pattern. And so the, there's two more quarks that have a little bit more mass. And there's a, a partner of the electron called the muon. That's just it's like an electron, except it's more massive. It's bigger. And that muon also has a neutrino that's associated to it. And it turns out there's even one more copy of that there. And then there's all of these force-carrying particles, so that gluon on the top right, which is the, you know, the thing that kind of glues the nuclei together. There's the photon, which is related to electromagnetism. It's sort of the carrier of electricity, the elect electrical magnetic force. And those W and Z bosons down on the bottom, those are the ones that actually do the weak interaction. Those are the ones that sort of govern how, how this weird weak interaction works. So each of the charged leptons, electron, muon, tau, has its associated neutrino, an electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino. There's all the antiparticles to all of this too, so you can take a mirror and basically get all the same back. And in the theory, it was basically thought that, like for the reasons I said before, neutrinos had no mass. That's how the theory sort of worked too. There was no evidence that neutrinos had any mass. They weren't the only particles with no mass. You know, photons have no mass, gluons have no mass, so that didn't seem so weird necessarily. And they're a little unique because they only, they, they don't have any charge. They don't have any electrical charge. They don't interact with the, 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 the gluon, the strong nuclear force. The, so they don't, they don't, you know, they don't combine together like the nuclei do. Um, the only way they interact is via the weak force, which is why it's so hard to see them. So, but, okay. So they fit into the theory and they're there and that just became sort of the standard of how it was. Okay, something wrong with the neutrinos. So uh, this is Ray Davis on the left. So he also wanted to go basically to the same place and try to detect neutrinos too. Um, 
And he had a, he had a nice idea. Um, so he wanted to detect not anti-neutrinos like Cowan and Rhines did, but or, uh, he wanted to detect neutrinos. And he was a, he was a bit of a chemist, and so and there had been this had been proposed for a while. But basically, what can happen is if you have a, uh, for instance, if you have a chlorine atom and a neutrino comes in and interacts with it, for rather low energies, what will happen is that the neutrino will interact with the chlorine. It'll produce an electron, um, but it changes. Uh, it changes a neutron to a proton in the atom itself, in the nuclei of the nucleus of the atom itself, and that changes because uh, you're changing from a neutron to a proton. It actually changes, you know, what we call the atom from a chlorine to an argon. And you can actually, um, if you have a, you know, this giant thing of of chlorine, you can actually go through and filter, you know, of this. They had a way to do this. Uh, uh, assay basically to go through and filter this giant of giant vat of chlorine and extract argon atoms from it, sort of single argon atoms from it. It's actually pretty crazy, pretty cool that they can that they were able to do that. But this was actually fairly well known even early on. So it became a it became a really nice idea to try to detect this. Um, but it only works. So this only works for neutrinos. It doesn't work for anti-neutrinos, and it doesn't work for it doesn't work for you know other kinds of neutrinos. It won't work for muon neutrinos. Um, and tau neutrinos, because this really only happens when the energy is really low. Or if the, sorry, if the energy is really low of the neutrinos, then this only happens for this certain type of neutrino. Okay, so, um, so Ray was, you know, wanted to detect neutrinos first, didn't, so he thought, okay, I know, I have another idea. I know another place where neutrinos are made, in the sun. So, sun is powered by nuclear fusion. There's a lot of processes of diff nu nuclear fusion going on in the sun. Um, it's all sort of nuclear physics. It's kind of you know like radioactivity and things like that. There's a lot of neutrinos that get produced in the sun, um, and so you can see sort of the different kinds of the neutrinos uh, and different energies of the neutrinos on the right there, um, but from the different sort of interactions going on in the, in the sun. But it basically uh, the sun is basically producing around 70 billion electron neutrinos per centimeter squared per second at Earth. That's what we see sort of at Earth. So not as much as the trillion that Cowan and Rhines, 10 trillion sort of that Cowan and Rhines had, but you know, 70 billion is uh, not, and you're getting them all the time. A little farther away. A little farther away, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The sun is a bit farther away, so you, know, you can't get 10 meters to the, you know, the core of the sun. So Ray was like, all right, sun produces neutrinos. I can do that. We can go after that. We have a prediction for how many neutrinos should be coming from the sun, we think. Um, and so he planned his detector. So in 1966, he had a, a tank that's shown on the left here, 100,000 gallons. It's basically dry cleaner. Um, and so that's the chlorine atom there. Um, and it's a mile below ground. And so it goes below ground because um, you want to shield yourself from any kind, of other, uh, any kind of other sort of radioactive elements that might come in and do something to your nuclei. Um, and so you have a nice clean environment uh, underground. Because I don't, so I don't know if you know, but you might, you might know, you might not know. We are constantly being bombarded by cosmic ray particles that are coming through us. You know, about uh, you know, every second, you know, you're getting hit by a cosmic ray. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second too. But um, so you know, it's just constant. Um, and so on the surface. But if you go underground. The, you know, the, the Earth sort of shields you from that more and more. And so the deeper you go underground, the cleaner and cleaner the environment sort of gets. The less and less likely you are to have some of these charged particles come through and, you know, interfere with your very, very, you know, clean detection of this very, very rare thing, you know, of neutrino interactions. So that's what Ray did. It was a, you know, and okay, we don't, <laughs> we're physicists, we get some funding. We don't get funding to build things to go a mile underground. So this was in a, in a gold mine in South Dakota, home stake mine in South Dakota. It's an excavated cavern on the side that they weren't using anymore. Like, all right, it's a good place to go. So you know, we do a lot of stuff for, for these neutrino experiments that go deep underground. It's usually, uh, uh, many of them are old mines or even some of them are still operating in some part, not in our part. Okay, and he did this and uh, Deep down, mile underground, 100,000 gallons of dry cleaner filled with chlorine, goes through, filters it out, collects about one argon atom every two days. So good, it's seeing solar neutrinos. So that's kind of exciting. The problem was that this was, well, it was a third of the expected rate. Now, okay, so you might say, 
come on, be happy, you're seeing anything. That's kind of a crazy thing to do. But, you know, that studied it for a while, you're getting two a day, you run for a while, you know, you build up enough statistics, you really think that, you know, I should, you know, I'm, I know what I'm seeing, and it's this level, and it's one third less than I should be seeing. So, why? Um, <laughs> the, actual, the actual comment back from Ray was, uh, yeah, we're ready. Uh, where's, uh, where's all these neutrinos from the sun coming? And so this became known as the solar neutrino problem. This persisted. And so um, the, and the two things that people said were, I mean, this was, I mean, what could it be, right? It's like, one, there's something wrong with your detector. There's something wrong with your experiment. And so, okay, that didn't make Ray too happy, but he was a calm and patient guy and he would like go through and say, no, 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 we really understand what's going on here. There's nothing wrong with the detector or the experiment. And the rest of the particle physicists were like, the sun, we don't know what goes on in the sun. You're talking about modeling the nuclear fusion in, in the center of the sun and trying to get the number of neutrinos to a factor of three correct. Like, there's just no chance. Like, there's just, you know, it's, it's a crazy, weird temperature dependence. And, you know, it's just, it's just hard to do. So, um, but a lot of patient effort. Uh, John Bacall was a, a really prominent sort of uh, astrophysicist, would do a lot of these really detailed and complex calculations and would really show that, no, 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 no. The, we think we really understand what's going on in the sun. We really think that, you know, we think that these neutrinos should be there. But this persisted for a long time. Um, and we'll get back to the conclusion of it, but yeah, it was really the solar neutrino problem is what it was called. Okay, but a quick detour. I talked about cosmic rays before. Um, so, in fact, those cosmic rays, so they're created by, you know, particles that hit the, the Earth's atmosphere. You know, particles from space and stuff hitting the Earth's atmosphere creates sort of a cascade of particles. Included in that cascade of particles are, you guessed it, neutrinos along with a bunch of other charged particles and things like that. Now, these are more energetic than the neutrinos coming from the sun. Don't worry, the neutrinos don't interact with you, they're not gonna do anything, right? Okay, but, um, and we don't really know, you know, it was, it was hard in getting theories and stuff to really predict exactly how many neutrinos there should be. But, there was something that we thought that we understood rather well. I remember I said that there were these two kinds of neutrinos, the electron, or three kinds of neutrinos actually, one for each of the different kinds of charged lepton. So there's the electron we all know and love, it has its neutrino, the electron neutrino. And there's the muon, which is kind of a heavier electron, and it has its neutrino. And they kind of interact, when they interact, they kind of interact in pairs. That's kind of how we, you know, tell the different neutrinos apart. We don't, because we don't see them very often, so, you know, but we, we don't, we don't actually see them ever, but we see the charged particle that they might turn into or that they might interact with. And there's a very sort of, you know, with all of the models of how uh, cosmic rays and stuff are formed in the atmosphere, there's a really solid prediction that you should basically see uh, twice as many muon neutrinos as you do electron neutrinos. And it just has to do with how the decays of the different particles go, because you have, a, you have certain particles called pions that decay into muons, and then those muons will then end up decaying into electrons. And so when the pions decay into muons, they produce a muon neutrino, and then when the muons decay into electrons, they produce a muon neutrino and an electron neutrino, because they kind of, you know, the neutrinos like to come with the leptons and the interactions. So it was this really sort of, who knows how many, but we know that there should be twice as many muon neutrinos as there are electron neutrinos. So that's really nice. And so people said, okay, in the interactions and stuff, electron neutrinos might interact with a neutron, produce a proton and an electron. And this is basically what I was saying before, a muon neutrino will do the same exact thing, basically the same exact thing. Here we go. But instead of producing an electron, it will produce a muon because that's its partner, that's its pair. And that's what it means to be a muon, muon neutrino, is that when you do this interaction, you produce a muon. All solid good physics. So people wanted to detect these. Actually, people wanted to detect some other things, but these things kind of came along the way. So there were these uh, detectors in a, in a number of different places, but I'm going to highlight two of them that were in Japan, Kamiokande and then sort of an upgrade of that that was called Super Kamiokande. And what they are is you can see a picture of, I think that's Super K on the, on the left. Um, and so, remember I, talk, I told you about PMTs that kind of look like light bulbs and, you know, the Clown and Ryans put these PMTs around this liquid scintillator to try to, you know, detect, you know, light and stuff in them. So these detectors are just giant filled, you know, vessels filled with water and then are just lined with all of these really beautiful 
PMTs all lined around them. And there's this company in Japan, Hamamatsu, that they, you know, when you want to make these PMTs really big, they're all, they're all hand-blown glass. So, you know, so whenever you want to, you, when you, you want to line a detector like this, you like, you know, you call them up and say like, you're going to be busy for the next two years, guys. Like, you know, it's a, it's, it's a really, a, it's a crazy thing. Um, and so how these detectors work is that, so yeah, they're water filled, uh, they're filled with water. They're surrounded by these light detecting PMTs. And what happens is that they're, they're actually measuring what's called Cherenkov light, Cherenkov radiation. So you have a neutrino come in, it hits the nucleus. And when it does that, remember I said, you know, if it's a muon neutrino, it should create a muon. If it's an electron neutrino, it should create an electron. And those muons and electrons, because the energy of the neutrino is pretty high, those muons and electrons are going, they have a lot of energy too in this outcome of the interaction. They're going pretty fast. And they're actually going faster than the speed of light in water. Not the speed of light overall. Nothing goes faster than the speed of light overall. Remember the joke from the beginning. Um, but uh, they're going faster than what the speed of light is in water because you know, the speed of light in water is a little bit slower than what it is in vacuum. And what happens when it does that is you create, you, you create this sort of shock wave of light. It's called Cherenkov light. And that's actually then what is, the, what is tried to be detected in these detectors here. And so you actually see something like this. So the electrons are, are muons that create this sort of cone of light. So you see these sort of rings that are there. Um, but electrons are a little bit different because um, muons, as they go through, they're, because they're a little bit heavier, um, they kind of... They, they kind of just go straight through for a little bit longer. So kind of a cleaner line. Um, and so they just make these nice, clean, sharp rings of light. The electrons, because they're a little bit lighter, they start to, kind of, they start to shower. They make these sort of what we call electromagnetic showers. So the electron, it, turns, you know, it has some energy and it radiates a photon. And then those photons will sort of be, turn into a, a pair of electrons and positrons. And those electrons and positrons will radiate photons. And those photons will turn into electrons. And so you can see this cascade of sort of a shower of particles. And because of that, you get kind of like a fuzzy ring from the electrons, because you have all these other sort of particles that are created as part of the electron going through that kind of make it not so clean and nice. So it's really nice because you can tell the difference between muons and electrons then. You just, it's just basically how sharp the ring is. So there's you know, a number of automated programs that go in and say like, okay, you know, this one's really sharp, definitely a muon. This one's kind of sharp, maybe a muon, maybe an electron. This one's really fuzzy, definitely an electron sort of thing. And so if you want to look at atmospheric neutrinos, Remember, we have twice as many muon neutrinos as electron neutrinos. So if you're looking in your detector, you should see twice as many muons as you do electrons. I'm not going to surprise you by telling you that's not what they saw. So this is results from Kami Okande. Electrons on the left with you know, some kind of prediction. Um, and then muons on the right. And so the prediction is, again, sort of twice as many events as the electrons. But the data points are those little points with the error bars there. What they actually saw are those data points. Um, and what? <laughs> it's the same number as the electrons. You know, it's not, it looks basically the same. So not twice as many, same number. That's a little weird. Um, and so this became known as the atmospheric neutrino anomaly. And so the questions were, you know, did you do something wrong with your detector? No. Do we really understand the atmospheric neutrinos? Yeah. So what's happening to them? What's happening to these muon neutrinos? Why, why do they seem to disappear? OK, so this is now getting into the 80s. Um, theorists have solved so many other things in terms of particle physics and going on. And there are these you know, long simmering ideas going around. And so this idea sort of you know, really kind of started to come together. What? What if? the neutrinos have a little bit of mass, just a little bit of mass. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, something, uh, you know, we might say that an electron neutrino has a certain mass and maybe a muon neutrino has a certain mass and a tau neutrino has a certain mass. But what if, what if it didn't really work that way? What if, you know, it was a little bit off? So that if you set an electron neutrino, uh, you know, it's quantum mechanics, things are a little weird. It's, it's not really one mass, but it's kind of, there's like a probability that it has one mass and a probability it has another mass. I mean, that's not a disallowed in quantum mechanics. That can totally happen. So maybe that's what's going on here too. And so this sort of theory and sort of phenomenology sort of uh, built up around this. So what happens is neutrinos, the physics of how neutrinos interact, so how they're created, how they interact with things, is defined by their flavor. That's what we mean. 
So they're created in definite states of flavor. Each of those definite states of flavor doesn't really have one mass. It's sort of a combination of, uh, of, of mass. Um, and so it's kind of a weird sort of quantum mechanical you know, state. And if those different matter waves and mass states, you know, they, if, the, if they're different, then as they evolve, as neutrinos sort of travel, they, they might sort of you know, get in and out of phase with each other and interfere and, uh, you know, constructively and destructively over time. So this was the idea. So, okay, here's how I would think about the world. You have a, like, a muon neutrino and a tau neutrino, and we would think that they have a certain a definite sort of mass, so that we would say this is the mass of the muon neutrino and this is the mass of the tau neutrino. Okay, so quantum mechanics says, particle physics says, doesn't have to work that way. What can happen instead is that you, know, you can have sort of a mix. So there's, there's one neutrino that has a certain mass, and it's kind of a mix of flavors. You know, it's like 50% muon and 50% tau. And then there's a, a, another neutrino that has a higher mass, and it's also a mix. So if it's 50% in the 50-50 in the first one, it's 50-50 in the second one, if there's only two neutrinos, for instance. Um, and so what it really just means is that you know, neutrinos get created as muons or taus. They travel as, through space as either neutrino 1 or neutrino 2, states of definite mass. And when they interact at a detector later, there's a probability that they'll turn into a neutrino, a muon, uh, there'll be a muon neutrino at that point, or a tau neutrino at another point. And so that looks kind of something like this. And so th these, these different mass states propagate differently through space. And it's really sort of you know, particles as waves and you know, things like that. So I mean, OK, so let me ask. People play musical instruments? Anybody play musical instruments? OK, yeah. Um, tuning, you know, when you tune an instrument or something like that, you know, like, and you're trying to match up with somebody else, you know, beat frequencies, right? So people, people know about beat frequencies. So, you know, as you get, you know, if you're trying to tune up, uh, you're playing an A and somebody else is trying to play an A and you're slightly out of tune, there's a different frequency in the, you know, in the sound wave that's getting created. And what will happen is that those different frequencies, you know, there's you know, 440 hertz on one, 441 hertz on the other, or whatever it is for you know, an A. Um, and th those waves um, interfere with each other as they travel through. And so what you'll hear is that if there's a little bit of a difference in frequency, you'll not only hear the, note, the different notes, but you'll also hear like a wah, 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 wah. And then you know you're in tune when you don't hear that anymore. Because you know, when you're right on, you know, there's, no, there's none of that beat frequency. And if you're really far off, you'll hear whoa, 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 and, you know, and it sounds awful, so you know that. It's the same thing that happens basically with neutrino states as they travel through. So you, you know, because they have the, the mass, because there's a difference in mass between them, they actually have kind of a different frequency that they travel with. And those frequencies, you know, they interfere with each other as they travel. And rather than kind of hear it through time, you can kind of see it through space. And so you have something like this that you might start with sort of 100% muon neutrinos and 0% tau neutrinos because you started with a muon decaying that always creates a muon neutrino. And then as it travels, because it doesn't, you know, there's these different mass states that are interfering with each other, there's a certain probability that later on that it will be more likely to be a tau neutrino than a muon neutrino. And then a little bit later on, it goes back. And then a little bit later on, it goes back. And so you, it's kind of like a what, 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 what from, that you're getting from the neutrinos themselves. And the probability of that um, is the thing on the right-hand side here. Um, so there's, a, there's what we call sort of a mixing angle. So that's sort of, you know, there's some parameterization of, you know, how, you know, how, what the maximum and minimum of that sort of probability is, how much they're mixed together. And then the probability that they change depends on a few things. Depends on how far away you are from the neutrino from when it was produced. That's the, that L, that length. The energy of the neutrino, because different, those different energies will kind of change how those different frequencies might interfere, or constructively or destructively. And it also depends on the difference in the mass between the neutrinos. It actually depends on the difference in the mass squared. And that's important, and I'll get to that in a reason. Uh, uh, I'll get to the reason why that's important in a minute. But those, so those things sort of define then what these sort of probabilities of a neutrino to turn in from one state into the other. Okay. How do you calculate mass of neutrinos? 
How do you calculate the mass of the neutrinos? That's a good question, because we, we never thought they had mass, right? So how do you, so we don't know. I mean, that's, that, that's we, we still don't know the mass of the neutrinos, actually. So yeah, so that, so yeah, you can, you can do that, but you actually don't, but, well, and we'll get to this in a, in a little bit too, but you, because it comes as a mass squared, you only get sort of the magnitude of the mass, and it's a difference in the mass squared between the states. You only get a difference between the masses. You don't know the actual masses, but, it, but you can figure out what the difference in the mass is, and that's based on these probabilities, exactly as you say. You kind of, you know, if you measure the probabilities, then you can reverse this and figure out what the difference in mass of those different states are. This is weird. <laughs> you can ask me more about it and stuff too later on. But it's also really kind of cool. You can have these fundamental particles that we thought were like these definite sort of things, these definite flavors, um, and they change into each other. This is like the fundamental nature of what they are, and they change into each other as they travel through space. That's crazy. OK, so that's a nice idea. But it's just an idea. You've got to prove it, right? So how would you, you have to figure out, you know, people are thinking, okay, muon neutrinos are changing and oscillating into tau neutrinos. So how do we actually do this? How do, how do we get this? Um, and it turns out, so, okay, so muon neutrinos are created, you know, we have these cosmic rays. They're created in the atmosphere. So we, that's where all these atmospheric neutrinos are coming from. You have, you know, you look up. There's the atmosphere. You look down. Well, if you go down far enough, through the Earth, there's atmosphere on the other side. And these are neutrinos we're talking about. They go through everything. So, you know, there's some will interact in the Earth, sure, that's fine. But a lot of them are still going to hit your detector, and you have a chance of detecting those. And those are different lengths. So you can actually probe this difference in L over E on this, how this probability determines, and kind of show that, I mean, there's no reason, there's no other reason you would expect neutrinos from up above and neutrinos from down below to have very different, you know, uh, very different rates in your detector unless they were changing and changing depending on this L over E. And that's what, that's what was shown. So you can see at these different, th these different L over E's, you can see, okay, there's the data to prediction. It's one at certain ones and then it like knocks way down at a, at a certain length and energy for the neutrinos. And this is sort of, I mean, there's just no other way in which we would think to be able to do this, to be able to produce this sort of thing. So this was really like a smoking gun for neutrinos, really proof that neutrinos were changing flavor. Because you just saw these muon neutrinos disappear. The quarks also behave in that way. But the quarks are kind of, the quarks are a little bit weird because, you know, they, they, um, they interact with the strong force. And so the strong force is just really, you know, like they, they always, the quarks always kind of come together. But yeah, they, they, they also interact in this way, and they, kind of, they can change flavor as well. And it's a, it's a little bit different, but it's actually, and that was also sort of understood and stuff too. So it wasn't so weird that this maybe could happen. OK, so back to the solar neutrino problem. So OK, we just have these atmospheric neutrinos. We have this nice smoking gun proof that these muon neutrinos are changing flavor. They're sort of disappearing in a sense and turning into a different kind of neutrino. What if electron neutrinos? produced in the sun are changing into other types as well. And so that was what this uh, experiment that called the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory um, around the 2000, 2001, um, decided to really take on. And so they had, they had what Ray Davis couldn't do. So on the top, you have this, what was called a charged current interaction. This is very similar to sort of what Ray Davis was trying to look for, right? You have a neutrino come in, interacts with a neutron, it makes a proton and it makes an electron. Um, and then you can try to detect the electron. This is looking, and this only works for electron neutrinos. So at low energies, at the energies of neutrinos from the sun, this only works for electron neutrinos. But there's also these neutral current interactions that can happen where you kind of have a neutrino sort of, it doesn't change the, it doesn't change the flavors or change the particle type of the nuclei, but it kind of bounces off of them. And what you can have happen is that a neutrino can sort of bounce off and kind of knock a neutron loose and then that neutron can then be captured and you can see some you know, signature of light from it later. And that's what this, uh, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory was able to do. They had, in the same detector, they had the ability to see this one kind of interaction and to see this other kind of interaction, where the first one is only electron neutrinos, so they can prove that Ray Davis wasn't crazy, that there was just really a third of the neutrinos coming from the sun. And then they had this way where it didn't matter what the neutrino type was, they should be able to see it. 
So they should then be able to, you know, if the neutrino rates are right, they should be able to see all of the neutrinos. And sure enough, that's exactly what they did. So you can see on the top line is sort of the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, you know, the ratio of what was predicted from the standard solar neutrino model um, to what was observed. And so um, on, the, on the bottom are the ones, are all of those experiments, uh, including rays and others, that only saw electron neutrinos, where they would always see like a third of the neutrino rate. And then in this new, neutral current mode in the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, those you know, pink and, and, and blue lines on the top there, that was in this neutral current mode. And they, that's, they were able to see basically all of the neutrinos they expected to see. And so it was really sort of, again, just strong, strong proof that this is exactly what's going on. You have electron neutrinos that are changing into these other types of neutrinos so that we only see a third of them in their normal electron way when we detect them at Earth. But when you look at all the neutrinos, you get all of them back. This was a big deal. <laughs> so neutrinos were thought to have no mass. This, in addition to this weird changing flavor sort of thing, it's also changing flavor sort of thing, you know, we saw that in quarks, and so maybe, you know, that's, that's okay, it can happen. But what it really means is that the neutrinos have to have mass, which is something that our theories did not predict. And that's definitely outside of the realm of what we thought was, was the case. And so it really, you know, the, one, the guy, the Takaki Kajita, he won the Nobel Prize. He worked on those atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, he said, you know, it really opens a window to study physics that's beyond our standard model of particle physics. Because these neutrinos uh, really interact in ways that we didn't understand before. Okay, why? Okay, that's what we're doing now. We're really trying to look through that new window. So um, the neutrino oscillations really solve those missing neutrino anomalies, but it implies that neutrinos have mass, and that really just asks a whole bunch of new questions. You know, why are the neutrino masses so small? Okay, that's a hard question. We can even ask, forget that, about why. What are the neutrino masses? That's also a hard question. We even forget that. That's why. What is the ordering of the neutrino mass states? We have these three different neutrinos. We, we don't even know because of it, that probability comes in a, a difference of the masses, but it's squared. We actually don't know the ordering, the full ordering of the states. And so it, actually, we have these sort of two different uh, thoughts and ideas right now. There's what we call sort of a normal ordering. We have these three different mass states. They're these mixtures of electron, muon, and tau neutrinos. And so a lot of the other particles have this sort of you know, these three different masses, uh, the charged leptons have, you know, the others, the electron, which is the lowest, the muon, which is next, and then the tau. And it, the tau neutrino is like much more massive than, than the other two. And the same thing in the quarks. We have the up quark, and then there's the uh, charm quark, which is a bit heavier, and then there's the top quark, which is just huge. And so this is what we call this sort of normal ordering, where we have these two states at the bottom that are closer together, and then it's further up to the top. But we don't know that that's the case. It could then also be this inverted ordering between them. And we have no idea. And you could say, OK, come on. Why does this matter? Why is this important at all? It's actually important because there's a lot of fundamental theories that pr make strong predictions about which way the ordering should go. And for instance, uh, we can ask, there's a lot of theories that, that, are, that think that neutrinos might be their own antiparticles. And our ability to detect that actually depends on what this ordering is. If it's an inverted ordering, we have a chance. And if it's a normal ordering, we have a little chance. But, but there's a chance that we'll never see anything. And this is just fundamental. We don't, we don't even know what this is. So another question you can ask are what are, you know, what are even the parameters of neutrino oscillations? So again, so we have, if you, um, I don't want to burden you with math too much, but you have this sort of the flavor states on the left-hand side. Um, and the different mass states, those one, two, three on the right-hand side, and you can kind of write up sort of a, what we call a mixing matrix that will you know, convert from one to the other. These are basically those angles um, and uh, the, those mass differences that I was talking about earlier. Um, and so that, that mixing matrix, we can parameterize in a certain way. It doesn't really matter. The importance of that doesn't really matter. But how it, how it shakes out is that it's described by three of these mixing angles, which is basically what the fractions of the different mixtures and stuff are. So whether it's 50-50 or 25-50 or, or whatever. Um, so those three different angles are determined sort of in, th in three different places. So there's a solar neutrino angle that was the one that was mapped to the solar neutrino 
problem, basically, in the solar neutrino oscillations. It's the atmospheric neutrino angle, what we call the atmospheric neutrino, which is the sort of the mixture of muons and taus that I mentioned before. And then there's the this theta-1-3, which we didn't know for a long time and just recently measured. We actually measured it using reactor neutrinos and different sets of reactor neutrinos. There's like this giant complex of nuclear reactors in China that they had put detectors in five different spots and uh, all over the place. It was a really complicated, crazy thing. But they were able to measure this third angle. And there's one more thing there. There's a, what's called a CP violating phase. And what that, what that thing means is it, it's basically a, 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 a message about any asymmetry between neutrinos and antineutrinos. Now, that is really something we care about as physicists because I don't know if you know, but we live in a world that's dominated by matter. There's antimatter around, sure, but the antimatter and matter, when they collide, they annihilate. And if there were a lot of antimatter, we wouldn't be here. And the rules of physics, they are pretty balanced between matter and antimatter. Not perfectly balanced. We've seen some imbalance in other places before, but not nearly enough to explain why we even exist. And so that is one of the key questions that we wondered. Now that there's this new window of neutrino oscillations that are happening, and that this is something that the way neutrino oscillations happen there's now this allowed asymmetry between neutrinos and antineutrinos. And that is something that we want to try to measure. OK, so how will we measure it? Dune, not that dune, a different dune. It's called the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. And this is what Fermilab is working on, or Fermilab is doing a lot of things. But this is one of the big new international projects that Fermilab is really taking uh, a key part in now. So what we'll have is we'll have, we have a lot of accelerators at Fermilab. And so what we do is we accelerate protons to high energies. We smash them into a target. We create a bunch of particles. Those particles decay into a lot of things, but including neutrinos, lots of neutrinos, um, mostly muon neutrinos or muon antineutrinos. We actually have the ability to do one and the other. It's really cool. Um, and then what we do is we send those muon neutrinos in a, basically in a beam you know, all the way to South Dakota, the same place that Ray Davis was doing his work, we are excavating and, and making new detectors there. And they'll be mile underground, you know, uh, deep underground. Um, and what we want to measure there is we want to see if we see the neutrinos, the muon neutrinos and uh, muon antineutrinos, but we want to see how often they change into electron neutrinos and electron antineutrinos. And by seeing those differences between the <coughs> oscillations of muon neutrinos to electron neutrinos and muon antineutrinos to electron antineutrinos, that's how we can tell of an asymmetry. That's how, one of the ways we can get at this potential asymmetry between antineutrinos and neutrinos, between matter and antimatter, and maybe give us a window into how we live in a matter-dominated universe to begin with. So, that is what we're doing. That is what is underway now. So this is a picture of all the you know, fancy people and dignitaries and senators from South Dakota and all of that um, you know, doing the first shoveling um, inside the cavern. This was only like a few months ago or six months ago, I think, less than a year. Um, one of the things I was working on at CERN when I was there in Switzerland was they're building a big prototype detector that's sort of a mock-up of how this is, what this is going to be and what this is going to look like. I don't know if you can see, it's hard to see the person on there, but you kind of see the steps and the ladder and that, that sort of thing. So that, that thing, and I'll describe how it works in a second, but it's, it's, fill, it's filled with sort of 1,000 uh, 1, tons of liquid argon. And that is 1 40th of the size of the detectors that we're going to be putting underground. So it's a big, giant prototype, uh, many meters tall, many meters across, and it's just a 40th of the size of the detectors that we're going to be putting underground. So yeah, it's going to take a while to do the construction. We have to excavate the area and do all of that, and then we have to go in and build the detectors. So that's what we're going to be doing over the next 10 years. But in the meantime, we're trying to do a lot of physics. So let me quickly explain, while well, I still have a tiny bit of time, I hope, how Dune will try to detect neutrinos. And so I mentioned it's going to be filled with liquid argon. And the type of detector is called liquid argon time projection chamber, or LAR TPC for short, if you're somebody like me who does this all, all day long, every day. So how it works is, let me give you an example. So we built one here at Fermilab um, called Microboon. It's one of the experiments I'm on. 
And so what it is, you can see a bunch of nice people standing inside of it. This one's, you know, this one's only like 100 tons. It's the size of a school bus, you know, small. Um, so there's a nice big metal sheet on the left that we put to a really, really high voltage. And then there's a bunch of wires really finely spaced on the right. And so you can see the different pattern of the wires on, on the bottom right there. And those wires, really thin, they're three millimeters apart. And there's three different planes of them that are oriented in three different ways. And we do that, and I'll, ex I'll explain kind of how the interactions work, but we, we orient them in three different ways, and it basically gives us a 3D picture of neutrino interactions that happen inside. And then we put all of that in this big tube that's on the top right here that we then fill with liquid argon. So it was a, it's literally a square peg into a round hole in this case. You can do it. Um, and we actually ha we also have these, you know, we also have some photo tubes on the side because there's a bit of light that gets produced when the neutrinos interact as well, and that light is useful for us to know when when interactions happen in the liquid argon. Okay, so how it works? Right, claymation time. So uh, neutrinos interact with argon atoms, cute little one right here. Um, they can produce, ew, sorry, that got covered up. They can produce charged particles in those interactions. We talked about some of this before, but some of the things they can produce are, say, one of these big protons on the right and a muon, charged muon, on the left. So this would be a muon neutrino that would be interacting to create a muon and, a, and then a proton. And what they do is that when those charged particles then get created, they have some energy. They then go through the argon. And as they go through the argon, because they have charge, they actually ionize some of the other argon atoms that are around them. And that ionization creates a bunch of little electrons. And those electrons, when you put them in a big electric field, they move. They move in the direction uh, of the electric field, or opposite direction of the electric field. Depends on your sense of sign. Um, and that's, we have, that's why we have that stainless steel sheet on one side at a really high, electric, uh, really high potential, really high voltage. Um, and so the electrons then move away from that and towards our detection wires. And then we see little blips of electrical signals when those electrons go by the wires or actually get collected on the very last plane of wires. So it looks something like this. So you have a neutrino interaction come in, a muon and proton get created. They then travel through. They do all this sort of ionization. Nice shaky camera work by me here. Um, and so that creates all these ionized electrons. You know, they kind of, the proton, you know, eventually stops because it, it, you know, protons typically don't go too far, but they leave a lot of ionization, whereas the muon will tend to go farther, leaves less ionization. Remember how I said muons are kind of these nice clean signals? It's the same here too. Um, and then those electrons drift down toward, in the opposite direction of that cathode stainless steel towards our wire plane. And what we end up getting is this really high, uh, th high, um, high resolution sort of 3D image. This is just sort of one plane of wires that we combine them together to get a 3D image of a, of a neutrino interaction. And so you can see the sense of scale. That little bar on the lower left is 30 centimeters. So, and so you can see what looks to be like a nice long muon track going from the top left to the bottom right. And then these shorter, high, more highly ionizing proton tracks. There's a little bit more color there. They're leaving a little bit more charge um, that you know, stop in the detector. And so then what we do is we get these images, we process them, and then we try to piece back together what the incoming neutrino must have looked like. Here's another picture. This one's more dramatic. So this was a slightly higher energy neutrino, we think, that created um, a lot of particles coming out of it, um, even including uh, this kind of fuzzy thing that you see down here, uh, this thing that's kind of going in weird sort of snaky sort of directions. That's an electromagnetic shower. So that's what created those fuzzy rings in the Cherenkov detectors. That's what we see in these liquid argon TPCs. And what's really nice is that we, you know, we can really see them and we can actually tell the difference, you know, both when you create a photon and when you create a, an electron, they both create these electromagnetic showers. But an electron has charge at the very beginning and so you see a bit of a little bit of a track from the electron at the very beginning, whereas a photon doesn't. You don't see anything until it pair produces and makes an electron-positron pair. And so we can actually tell the difference in these detectors between electrons and photons, which is one of the things that we really want to be able to do because we want to be looking for electron neutrinos in them. Here's an example of what we think is an electron neutrino interaction, actually, so that we have you know, this nice single sort of shower develop, but there's this nice track of an electron that does that, that's there before it develops, kind of going from the left to the, to the thing on the right. 
And so that's exactly, this is exactly the kind of thing that we're looking for in Dune. We want to see muon neutrinos that change into electron neutrinos and then do this in our detector. Another question, another important question is, are there other kinds of neutrinos? And we have this nice standard model. The neutrinos are paired to the charged leptons. There's these three generations of particles. So you know, we think there's three neutrinos. That's it. Everything kind of looks you know, like there's this nice three neutrino oscillation. But those neutrino oscillations could be a little bit different if there was another kind of neutrino. And that kind of neutrino wouldn't interact with anything in any of the standard ways. It's, sort of, it's not part of our any existing models. Um, and so this is a window into new kinds of interactions, new kinds of particles that are completely outside anything like what we know. And there's little hints of this happening from other experiments. So uh, react experiments that were close to reactor neutrinos, you know, they saw, you know, they, they see 98% of the neutrinos they think they should see, but there's 2% kind of missing and it's a little weird. And there's, you know, a bunch of other sort of experiments and things that show these hints that maybe there's some non-standard oscillations going on. And so this is one of the things that we're doing at Fermilab right now. It's that what, what we call it sort of, you know, for Dune, we're sending a particle beam from Fermilab to South Dakota. We call that long baseline. It's a, it's a long way away. Um, we're doing a short baseline experiments at Fermilab right now, where we produce a neutrino beam at Fermilab, and we put detectors that are sort of, you know, football fields length away from the source of the neutrinos. And it's really nice. We, so we have what we're going to have over the next few years is we're going to have three of these liquid argon time projection chambers that are positioned at different sources along the beam. So it's a little bit hard to see, but let me point it out on this one here. So here's where the beam, here's where the beam is. This is where the neutrinos, this is where the protons hit that target, produce all the neutrinos. And then 100 meters downstream of that, we have our first detector. This is great because this is, what this tells us is, you know, this beam is mostly muon neutrinos. But even there's some electron neutrinos that get created when we, when we create the beam. It's like 0.5% of the total neutrinos. But we're looking for something that's very non-standard. So we want to make sure that we know what that 0.5% background of sort of intrinsic electron neutrinos is. And by putting it really close to the beam, it's before, it's before the, any muon neutrinos would have a chance to oscillate. So it's just, you know, there's just no way they would have oscillated by that. Then another few hundred meters downstream of that is where Microboon sits. And then a few, another hundred meters downstream of that is where a giant new detector called Icarus is, is being put and built right now. Those ones, that's where we're looking for electron neutrinos to appear. So we measure and see how many electron neutrinos exist in the beam as it is here. That gives us a prediction for the number of intrinsic electron neutrinos we should see in these FAR detectors. If we see any excess of electron neutrinos above that in these FAR detectors, that must be muon neutrinos turning into electron neutrinos. And that's how these sort of near, that's how these oscillation experiments often work. We have a near detector that tells us what the beam looks like. And then we have a FAR detector where we try to see an excess of neutrinos or, or a deficit of neutrinos relative to that beam. And so yeah, so that, this, is, this was the other thing that I was working on while I was at CERN. I was doing, they were doing a refurbishment of this detector. So it used to be in Italy, um, and then it got refurbished at CERN, and now it, it put it on a ship, got over, sent over here to Fermilab. So this is one of the modules of the Sicarus detector. So it's um, much like the one I showed you before, except it has, its, it has its cathode plane in the middle and wires on either side. So really high voltage in the middle. And then the electrons, when they get created, they'll drift to the other sides on both of them. And then there's two of these, and they're sort of 20 meters long. And so they're you know, about six, seven times the size of microboon. So it's a really big detector. We should see lots of neutrinos. And so if there is any of these non-standard oscillations, we're going to see it here. And that's going to be brand new physics that no one expects that will completely change our view of the world. So I just leave you with that quote from uh, about neutrinos opening this new window. And just say that uh, around the world, we're now really using neutrinos to really try to unlock these sort of fundamental questions about you know, the, our existence, what kinds of particles are there, and everything. So that's it. Thank you.